Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the 6.5 Summit. Daniel Newman here, CEO of the Future Group. I'm excited for this next conversation, part of our DevOps track. We've got Sonatype joining us, and it's CEO Wayne Jackson. Wayne's a first-timer, and I couldn't be more excited to have you, have you, Wayne, as part of the conversation. Welcome to the 6.5 Summit. Thanks, Daniel. Great to be with you. It is. It's really exciting times. Um, look, Sonatype, com- the company has a huge pedigree, very respected, very known in the communities in which it's served. 6.5 Summit, we go chips to SaaS. So we've got executives across from semiconductors to automotive and so much more. Give me the quick you know, 60 second on Sonatype for those that maybe aren't familiar with all the work you're doing. I'm happy to. Um, so we're very much focused on innovation um, by way of software. Um, for those who aren't aware, most software uh, these days is assembled rather than being written. And most of the parts that, that uh, are used in that assembly are open source. And so uh, we think of that um, all in supply chain context. Um, so helping organizations optimize their supply chains using the best projects, the best open source, um, and of course, securing their supply chains uh, to, to keep out emergent threats uh, like malware. So there are a lot of different problems that can be solved with software. Um, I like how you kind of use that assembly line. Of course, anybody that's sort of following, you know, the GitHub growth, the the co-pilot innovations that have been discussed in the marketplace. You kind of listen to even uh, NVIDIA Jensen, CEO Jensen Wong, talking about just how uh, programming, coding, developing is going to change. I imagine that you guys are identifying and seeing different new problems. So what is the big problem that Sonatype is solving right now for its customers? Um. I think uh, probably a multi-dimensional problem. Um, you know, there are so many uh, open source projects out there, tens of millions. Um, we see literally a million to two million commits a week now. Uh, and so for developers, uh, picking the highest quality projects, picking the sets of functionality that most align to the goals for innovation that they have um, is just not easy. Um, and then you start to layer in the security dimension. Um, now you're asking folks who aren't necessarily trained in making security decisions. Um, you're trusting them with with making choices um, that directly relate to uh, and affect the the cyber hygiene of an organization. Um, you may remember back to um, Struts, um, which was such an impactful event for companies like Equifax. Um, more recently, Log4j, which was a global um, uh, impact related to open source and open source vulnerabilities. Um, and so helping people org- uh, avoid those kinds of scenarios is a, is a huge responsibility. Um, and then as a more emergent phenomenon, we're starting to see uh, nefarious actors targeting open source ecosystems themselves um, and, and delivering malware into those ecosystems um, with the intent of actually compromising developers um, and development pipelines. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out. You know, the session title is Today's AI is Tomorrow's Security Threat. And, you know, I love that because, you know, as you as I'm listening to you talk, Wayne, I'm sort of thinking to myself, well, there's kind of these two parallel tracks, right? Develop in critical applications as fast as you can. And then there's the, oh, we got to do that securely. And AI is accelerating things super fast, right? You can build apps really, really quickly. And by the way, that, this was revolutionized even before this last few years of generative and, and speech to code and image to code, but even just with low code and no code, how fast app development got. Um, but whose problem is this? Like, you know, the developers, probably most of them would, would say that they're not security. You know, they're focused on building the app. You know, is it the CISO? I mean, with problems of this size and security problems scaling as quickly as they are, whose job is it to solve this problem? I, I think there's a shared responsibility. Um, you know, the, the 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 thing that's become obvious to me is that the is the original design of application security and application related hygiene, uh, where you have a silo that is security and a silo that is innovation and sort of in between, there's this thundercloud of dispute <laughs> for who's creating problems and who's slowing down innovation. Um, I think that model's broken. Uh, and, and so ultimately, I think there's a shared responsibility and hopefully the same kind of unification of, of, uh, of function that we saw with QA. Um, you may remember back in the old days when I was actually writing software, um, QA was a standalone function. Uh, and ultimately, we had to see that uh, that function dissolve into the process of innovation. And I think you're going to have to see 
Um, the same thing happened with traditional AppSec. Now, what that means is that we're going to have to get much better at delivering the ideals of the AppSec function into the innovation process itself, um, in, much in the way that we have with QA. Um, and, 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 so, uh, and so I think that's a cultural shift, which is always a bit of a challenge that has to happen. You know, companies like Sonartype um, who are developing tooling and, and providing data and, and better insights for the development processes, we have to get better um, at integrating into developer workflows um, and, and to help security um, you know, do the assurance efforts that they need to as developers are doing their thing. Because ultimately, you know, developers are working because of businesses need innovation. And so we can't get in that in the way of that process. Um, but, you know, as evidenced by some of these, you know, horrible events uh, over the last few years, we can't we can't just turn a blind eye to the to the risks um, that are associated with with vulnerable software. And now we enter AI. Right. The whole event that we're doing here, AI unleashed, AI accelerates everything. AI, you know, drives faster, uh, you know, both innovation, adoption, um, you know, shorter diffusion of innovation into the market. It also creates, you know, with every new technological wave, it creates just as many bad actors as good. Sometimes it feels like even more, meaning the speed and keeping up and dealing with the bad actors. So like, you know, AI isn't, you know, like I said, there's a lot of debate on the good and the bad of it. But when it comes to the security aspects of it, how much are you seeing AI complicating it? How much are, are we seeing more malicious intent? Has it been notable in your world? And uh, what are the potential risks? What are the downfalls for companies if they can't figure out how to deal with this? Well, I think most folks agree that one of the main challenges of especially generative AI in the context of cyber is that it makes developing malware easier. <laughs> um, and there are actual models out there on the market, uh, both um, uh, the, the light net and the dark net, uh, where people can acquire models to, to, to generate um, even very sophisticated polymorphic uh, malware. Um, and so that is going to make things a challenge. You know, it's just inevitable. Um, but on the other hand, we're getting better at leveraging models and AI to do malware detection. Um, you know, I mentioned the number of commits that we see, you know, numbering a, a million to two million commit events uh, per week. Um, you know, we have to, if, if we care about stopping the malware problem in open source, um, you know, then we have to inspect every one of those commits. Uh, and doing that with humans would be practically impossible. Um, but fortunately, AI does make inspection and identification of suspicious behavior, um, illicit committer activity, um, something that is possible. And so, you know, I guess insofar as malware or, or AI is making malware more prolific, uh, we're also being able to use AI to, to detect uh, suspicious behavior um, and to stop the delivery of malware at the source. So uh, a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, you know, in terms of the use of models, uh, one of the things that we're also focused on is helping organizations get a handle on what models are being brought into their organizations. Uh, because as you know, they all have different uses of data, different copyright terms, um, you know, and different implications in terms of the quality of output. Um, and so um, as with, you know, back in the old quote unquote days where we were helping people get their hands around open source and creating transparency around the number of libraries in their infrastructure. We're also trying to do the same thing for, for AI models. And so when you look at that, like a lot of AI, right, even the way it's fragmented or segmented in the market right now, right, is they're sort of open and closed, right? That's kind of the way it's being debated. There's a large subset of AI that's being developed in open, uh, you know, and you're seeing the kind of the rise of the the hugging faces and others that are really trying to democratize it. And then you're seeing other companies sort of like the irony of open AI is that it's, it's actually not particularly designed to be open. Right? <laughs> it's actually designed, it's, it's open for us to use. Um, but having said that, like, you know, is that the layer where a lot of the exposure and risk comes into though? Because like when it's open, right, obviously the way it gets iterated upon, the way it gets developed and built upon, it also does create, more risk because of the way it's 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 managed kind of cohorted as opposed to kind of being you know in its own little in its own little bubble so you know Wayne, what are you seeing there is that is that the big exposure point open source or is it something else um it's certainly a reasonable debate point um but i'm of the view that openness and transparency ultimately win 
Uh, and if you look at, um, at traditional cyber as an example, I think the days of security through obscurity are dying. Um, you know, the, the, the notion of making your software more secure by obscuring its flaws <laughs> um, you know, is ultimately a recipe for disaster. Uh, and if you look at regulation now, um, you know, uh, the White House pronounced requirements for, for software bills of materials uh, as an example, basically an ingredients list of the things that are being delivered to the federal government. Even more uh, aggressive regulation in the EU um, are all about transparency uh, and democratizing what vendors are sharing and what consumers should know about the software that they're using. Um, I think the same thing is going to happen inevitably in, in, in uh, AI, and I, I hope that what we've learned about openness and cyber will translate into an acceleration of the openness of, of AI models. Yeah, and by the way, I'm a huge open source fan. It's simply just the size and scale with what, about three quarters to 80% or so of all software is developed that way. Um, so yeah. it's it's a huge part. So it creates risk because it's also just the largest part. It was kind of like the old, remember the old Apple Windows debate about how many vulnerabilities? Well, it's like, look at how many users. So you always you, know, you always have to sort of weigh out the actual market adoption to the market size. And you go, of course, there's going to be some risk created there. You know, he said something that, that, that is really important too. And, and you know, um, it's probably... I don't want to hit you on regulation, but actually right before I want to do that, I want to go back a little bit and kind of couple that with Sonatype's market position. You know, you guys have something around like 70% of the Fortune 100. Um, you work with a lot of these regulated uh, companies, financial institutions, et cetera. Why do regulated industries uh, find what the work you do, work Sonatype does to be so important to their, you know, DevOps and, and the continued development of their software. Um, I think in in the the regulated regulated industries, um, you know, as, as you know, finance is one of our biggest verticals. Um, you know, they've have a, have a massively important critical mission, um, and beyond just being regulated, I think they instinctively care about um, the quality of their infrastructure, the quality of the software that they produce, uh, and the integrity of their organizations generally. Um, and so, you know, I'd like to think that we're pretty well proven as a best of breed provider of what we do. Um, and so the folks that naturally care uh, the most about um, innovating uh, in a very hygienic way are going to be biased towards uh, making best of breed choices. Um, you know, that often doesn't happen further down market where there isn't just the bandwidth to make best of breed choices about everything that's being used. Uh, but in the large organizations, again, and in, in, in regulated industries like finance, there generally is the bandwidth and the interests uh, to make those kinds of choices. Um, you know, and and uh, you know, you, you touched on the the level of open source. You know, the typical software, um, but critical systems. Um, you know, the 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 software that runs the world, uh, it facilitates interbank transfers. Um, you know, most of those systems are mostly open source. Um, and and so the choices that are made with the regard to the open source is is literally critical to the world's functioning. Listen, I've got about a minute with you left, and Wayne, it's been a lot of fun learning both about what your you know what Sonatype is doing and sort of your perspective on the impact AI has on the market and why executives are going to be tr chasing keeping up with with the challenges and, and security. But for those regulated industries, you know uh, the government stuff. Like, what is a piece of advice or two that you're, you're, you would give as kind of a best practice to, to stay up to par, given how fast things are moving? Um, I, I'll, I'll sort of lean on a, a gentleman named Edwards Deming, uh, who, as you may know, was the transformative figure in supply chain automation uh, and optimization for, the, for, for Toyota, uh, helped transform them from a textile manufacturer to the world's leading automobile producer, or one of them anyway. Um, and he, he emphasized uh, transparency uh, first and foremost. Um, be aware of you know what's being integrated, uh, how it's being integrated, uh, and so forth. Um, picking the best suppliers uh, and picking the highest quality parts from those suppliers. So on open source terms, picking the best projects. Uh, but maybe most importantly was empowering developers um, to, to make decisions in the natural course of, of what they do, just as Toyota does with the Andon Cord, empowering uh, line workers to identify defects, to, to stop the assembly line if necessary, to not just fix the defect, but fit, fix the issues that led to the possibility of a defect. Um, and so I think, you know, embracing uh, supply chain principles in software, 
uh, can have the same kind of transformative effect, especially nowadays with the acceleration of, of innovation with AI um, that we saw in traditional manufacturing. Well, Wayne, I think you did a really nice job there of summing it up and bringing together the good old people in people, process, and technologies. Wayne Jackson, CEO, Sonatype, thanks so much for being part of this year's 6-5 Summit. It's going to be very exciting to watch the company, Sonatype, continue to innovate and advance. And of course, the impact that AI has on all of us and all of our businesses. Stay tuned, everybody. Stick with us for more coverage and content here at the 6-5 Summit Studio. Sending it back to you.